evening, ladies and gentlemen, and on behalf of the chapter of St. Paul's Cathedral and the whole cathedral community, a very warm welcome here this evening for the next in our series of forum debates, The Case for God. We're delighted that you're all here this evening, and we should take this opportunity of thanking Elizabeth Foy, who manages the forum series for us and has devised this excellent program that we're in the middle of, and also Rob Gordon of the St. Paul's Institute, who facilitates the debates by broadcasting them on the Cathedral website and also on our YouTube channel. So thanks to them, and thanks to all of you for being with us. I'll introduce our speaker in a moment, but on behalf particularly of those of you who may not have been to one of our debates before, let me just explain uh, the shape of the evening and how it all works. In a moment, Karen Armstrong will speak about why she thinks there is a case for God in our lives. If you've got a question for her, Write it down on the back of the leaflets that you've been given while she's speaking. And then you hold it up in the air. And you probably have to wave it around a little bit. Uh, and one of the wandsmen will come over and take it off you. And it will be taken away and then sent to me uh, on my laptop so that I can ask it uh, of uh, Karen Armstrong. But that will carry on until about 7.30. So if you have a question, write it down, wave it in the air, and somebody will come and take it off you. And then we'll finish promptly at 8 o'clock. And Karen Armstrong's books, I'm delighted to say, are on sale here this evening, uh, here under the dome, uh, and she's very kindly agreed to sign copies of them, so do come forward afterwards if you'd like to. But now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker. Karen Armstrong is one of the world's leading commentators on religious affairs. She spent seven years as a Roman Catholic nun in the 1960s, but then left her teaching order in 1969 to study English at Oxford. And in 1982, she became a full-time writer and broadcaster. She's the best-selling author of 15 books, including The Spiral Staircase, her memoir of her own spiritual awakening after leaving the convent, and books about Christianity and Judaism, the Buddha, Islam, myth, the Bible, and indeed, the case for God, what religion really means. She's also a passionate campaigner for religious liberty and the founder of the Charter for Compassion. She's addressed members of the United States Congress and the Senate and has participated in the World Economic Forum. And we're honored and delighted to have her with us tonight. So please give a very warm welcome to Karen Armstrong. When I was a child, I had to learn this definition of God in the Roman Catholic Catechism. What is God, was the question, and not phased at all by the enormity of that question, this was what we had to reply. God is the supreme spirit who alone exists of himself and is infinite in all perfections. Now, I have to say that at eight years old, that didn't mean much to me. And I still find it a rather arid and pompous definition. But as a result of my studies now for over 20 years of the world religions, I've also come to the conclusion that it is incorrect. Because it takes it for granted, first of all, that you can simply draw breath and define a word whose literal original meaning, define, means to set limits upon, a reality that has to go beyond all we can think and know. Um, despite the extreme um, sophistication of our scientific and, and literary culture, our thinking about God and religion is often rather Primitive, undeveloped. Perhaps the two are related in some way. 
Um, and certainly, I, I, if I look back at some of the great luminaries of the past, Maimonides in the Jewish tradition, uh, Thomas Aquinas in the Christian tradition, uh, Ibn Sina in the Muslim tradition, they would have been appalled by that definition. Uh, Maimonides, for example, and here he was followed very much by most of the great monotheists, uh, said, uh, you cannot even say that God exists because our notion of existence is so limited that it cannot possibly apply to God. Um, you, you can't say that God is good. We talk about a good uh, meal or a good dog and a good person how can we apply goodness, our, con our splintered concept of goodness, to God? Um, and so, and, and certainly God is not the supreme spirit or the supreme being, because that suggests he's just a being like us, but at the top of the hierarchy. Whereas when we're speaking about God, we're talking about something very different. And frankly, many uh, people, as we'll talk th find tonight, uh, find that definition of God not only incorrect, as I do, but incredible. And uh, we've made a problem for ourselves, and I want to sort of explore that tonight. In about the 10th century before Christ, um, the priests of India, the Brahmins, uh, developed a form of religious discourse which I think becomes a model of theology. It's called the Brahmodya competition. And the object of this competition was to find a, uh, a, a formula, a verbal formula for speaking about Brahman, the ultimate reality uh, of the Hindu tradition. Now, uh, Brahman, the word Brahman can be translated the all. Brahman is everything that exists. So you can't possibly define it because it is everything. Um, and you can't talk to Brahman because Brahman is in you. It's, it's you. You are Brahman as well as something. It's not something out there. Brahman is impersonal. Um, it is utterly indescribable. And yet these priests were setting themselves the task of finding a, a, a way to use words to speak about Brahman. So uh, the challenger would kick off and drawing on his immense learning and spirituality, he would come out with a statement about Brahman which was perhaps very learned, riddling, poetic, elusive. And the other priests would have to listen. And then, drawing upon that, they would have to take it a step further. And so they would go on, each uh, building on the learning and spirituality of the last speaker. But the winner of the competition was the priest who uh, made them all keep silent. When they heard what he said, they fell into silence. And in that moment of silence, the Brahman was present. It was felt to be present. The Brahman was not in our world wordy definitions, but in the stunning realization of the impotence of speech. And that's what really good theology should be. Instead of saying, telling us what God is in a single sentence, it should lead us to realize the idiocy of what we're saying in the kindest possible way. Um, it's a bit like the, um, the, the, that moment at the end of a concert when the last notes of the symphony die away, there's often a very full, very emo emotive beat of silence in the hall before the applause starts. Now, good theology should be helping us 
like the, as the Brahmodya competitors did, to live in that moment of full silence, when we realize that we've come to the end of what words and thoughts can do. Because transcendence is built into the way we experience the world, we experience life. Whether we call it God or Brahman or, or not, we are constantly coming up against the limits of what we can say and know. And we seek such moments out so that uh, when, uh, if we don't find them in a church like this anymore, we'll look for it in dance or music or uh, sex or art or poetry. Something that makes, we, we seek out moments of what's called ecstasy. The Greeks call it ecstasy, which means stepping outside, where we feel transported beyond ourselves, and that we're fulfilling our humanity, uh, living our humanity more intensely and fully than usual. And yet, it's very difficult to put those moments into words and yet we, we seek them out. That's what theology did. All the great world religions, including the three monotheisms, have all developed their own form of Brahmodya competition. We'll be talking about St. Thomas Aquinas's a bit later. Uh, but in, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was in St. Petersburg, and we attended the liturgy there, and I very much remembered had in my mind Dennis the Areopagite. Some of you will never have heard of Dennis. Uh, and yet in the Middle Ages, uh, until the Reformation, he, what, this Greek Orthodox thinker was one of the most uh, in, important and seminal authorities in Western theology, Western Christian theology. And the fact that we don't know him uh, now uh, is a sign, a, a symptom of our spiritual predicament of our undeveloped, rather primitive way of talking about the divine. Because in the liturgy, uh, Dennis would constantly be saying to the audience when he came to, to preach, listen to the scripture, and when you hear God called a rock, you know God is not a rock. When you hear God called a warrior, you know God is a warrior, and yet not a warrior. And you go on further to say God is not good. God is not one. God is not three. And at the end, you are coming up to that Brahmodya moment when you cross over into transcendence, into ecstasy. The medievals had a word for that part of the mind that tips over into transcendence. They called it intellectus. Now, um, you might say, well, what about revelation then? I mean, that may be all right for a re religion such as Buddhism or Hinduism, but we believe that our God uh, has revealed itself to us uh, in scriptures, in the man Jesus, um, and in the, in the world around us. This, there has been revelation. But again, uh, we mustn't think, as we do in the modern world, that re revelation means that everything is now cut and dried and we have it all sewn up. Uh, the, uh, here I like to tell some story, two stories about uh, the Jewish rabbis in the time of the Talmud. Um, because the, uh, it, the idea the, the rabbis had was that revelation is never finished. We are all still standing beside Moses on Mount Sinai. And every time a Jew confronts the scripture, it means something different. Because the word of God is infinite and cannot be tied down to a single interpretation. Uh, so you can't look up you know, what God says about this because it will mean something different, something that the biblical author would never have thought of. And the person who invented this uh, very inventive form of scriptural interpretation was Rabbi Akiva, who was uh, probably uh, uh, martyred by the Romans in the early 2nd century. Uh, 
he, it was said of Rabbi Akiva that his brilliance was so extraordinary that his fame reached heaven and Moses heard about it and he was absolutely intrigued. So he came down to earth one day and attended Rabbi Akiva's Torah class and he sat at the, the, the eighth row at the back of all the other students and found to his acute embarrassment that he couldn't understand a word of what Rabbi Akiva was saying about the Torah, the law, which had been revealed to him, Moses, on Mount Sinai. And he went back to heaven shaking his head and saying, my children have conquered me, my children have gone beyond me, rather like a proud father. And one of the other rabbis put this rather more succinctly. He said, what God, what was revealed to Moses, what was not revealed to Moses was revealed to Rabbi Akiva and his generation. Re Revelation goes on. And there is no definitive form. Another story of the early rabbis involves the great Rabbi Eliezer, who had, was a very opinionated man. And one day he was standing, uh, having an argument with couple of his colleagues in the House of Studies uh, about a particular point of Jewish law and he could not bring them round to his own interpretation. So in desperation he asked God to perform some miracles to prove that he was right and sure enough a carob tree moved 300 meters of its own accord from right to left uh, the water in a canal started flowing uphill against the laws of nature. And the walls of the House of Studies suddenly shook and seemed on the point of collapse. But the other rabbis were simply not impressed. In fact, Rabbi Joshua uh, spoke very severely to the walls and said it is not suitable that walls should collapse when the sages are inside discussing serious matters. And finally, uh, Rabbi Akiva in, said, I want a voice from heaven to tell me who is right. And obligingly, a voice boomed down from the sky, why are you quarreling with Rabbi Eliezer? The Torah is always exactly as he says. And Rabbi Joshua looked up and said, no. And he quoted back to God his own scripture, quite out of context, it is not in heaven, from Deuteronomy. And the commentator of this story says that uh, it, what he meant was that on Mount Sinai, the law left heaven and came down to earth. It is no longer the business of heaven. It is now enshrined in the heart of every Jew and nobody, not even a divine voice, can tell another Jew what to think. Now this is the kind of uh, freedom, in a sense. Uh, this creative freedom with the, uh, and a sense of exploration and newness that we tend to have lost as we cling nervously to orthodoxy. Part of it is a, 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 a misunderstanding of what we call myth. Um, in popular parlance, a myth is often something that simply isn't true. If a politician is accused of a peccadillo in his past life, he'll often say, oh well, it's a myth, it, it didn't happen. But uh, the word myth in pre-modern uh, the pre-modern world, was not a, uh, an inferior version of history. A myth was more than history. Uh, it's been well described in this way. A myth is something that in some sense happened once, but which also happens all the time. It's the timeless element in a story that you have to bring out and apply to your own circumstances. Um, it's also been said very well that myth is an early form of psychology. 
all those stories about gods going in search of uh, maidens in, and, and uh, going through labyrinths and killing monsters and demons, uh, they're not meant to be real uh, historical events. But they're telling us what to do in ourselves when we have to cope with our own labyrinthine psyche and fight our own demons and risk our own lives in the accomplishment of truth. Um, and the myth is, some, is, above all, a program for action. It's no good just reading a myth. You won't get it unless you put it into practice. And I think this, in particular, is something that we, we've lost. Now, let's look at the creation myth, which is causing us all a great deal of trouble these days. Uh, God created the world in seven days, etc. Now, since the um, beginning of the scientific era, and I'll come to that in a minute, We've tended to read our texts literally, our scriptures with a literalism that is absolutely unparalleled in the history of religion. Um, the creation myth was telling you something timeless. Uh, the priestly author was saying something very clear to his own people at that time who were living in captivity under the Babylonians about the difference of their god from Marduk, the creator god of the Babylonians, who created the world in huge battles and killing and catastrophe. Uh, and created the world by, by taking one of, these, one of these defeated gods and splitting him in half. Uh, no, said the priestly author, our god doesn't need to fight. He simply creates the world in a, out of sheer command. And instead of violence and fighting, God blesses everything that he has made and says that it is very good and rests on the Sabbath. So it is giving a very ironic view uh, of the creation process. No one thought of reading uh, the first chapter of Genesis as a literal account of the origins of life. Um, the, uh, in, in here in Europe, right up until the Reformation, people were encouraged to read their scriptures allegorically. You would start, it was a four-step process, and to every uh, word of scripture, every verse of scripture, every story of scripture, you applied four, uh, four methods. First, you read the plain text, and you had to do the plain text seriously and study it and see what was happening. Then you move to what they call the spiritual or the allegorical sense. Then you moved up and went to the moral sense and extracted from this a moral that the biblical author would never have thought of, but which applied to your own situation, just as the rabbis did. And finally, the mystical sense, the eschatological sense. And I have to say that as a Catholic child, this was roughly how we were taught to read uh, the Bible. We didn't read the Bible very much. We thought that was a rather Protestant thing to do. But uh, we, well, nevertheless, uh, we read it in this way. And the word evolution never cropped up at all as a religious problem. Now, the early fathers of the church who came across these extraordinarily difficult uh, uh, biblical texts, for example, said we cannot take these things literally. Oregon, the first, one of the first great exegetes, we cannot take these texts literally. In fact, he said God has actually put the contradictions in scripture to remind us to spring up to the spiritual sense, to the allegorical sense. And St. Augustine, uh, you can call him, if you like, the founder of the Western rational tradition, said that if a scriptural statement contradicted reputable science, you must find a new allegorical interpretation of that verse. 
because uh, God could not contradict science. And right on the cusp of the scientific revolution, you have Calvin, no less, um, being taking to task what he calls those frantic persons who uh, like to uh, vilify what they don't understand. He's commenting on the first chapter of Genesis. And he says that, that there are some people with the new scientific discoveries who are f troubled because these seem to contradict scripture. For example, uh, the Bible says that the sun and the moon are the largest of the heavenly bodies. And now our scientists, he says, are telling us that Jupiter is bigger than the moon. Well, the problem is, says Calvin, that they're not talking about science. Um, their science, he says, is very useful and must not be impeded by these frantic persons who don't know what they're talking about. Science, scripture is not talking about science, it's talking about other things. And if you want to find out about the cosmos or astronomy, don't look in scripture, look elsewhere. Well, now you may say, well, um, you know, God as the literal creator of the world, this is how we think of it. And we think of Thomas Aquinas, who uh, after is famous for uh, have, evolving five proofs for God's existence. Uh, he decides that God is the first cause. God is the, he's, he's using, he's not frightened of science. Uh, Aquinas is uh, looking at the physics and science of Aristotle at a time when it was considered very, very risky and unorthodox to do so. It was, now, uh, Ar Aristotelian science is a bit uh, absurd to us today but it was cutting edge at the time Aquinas was writing. And so he takes Aquinas's proofs and he looks at what Maimonides and Ibn Sina had to say about this. Again, he wasn't at all afraid of learning from Jewish and Muslim sources. And he says, yes, God was, is the highest excellence. God is the unmoved mover. Uh, God is the first cause, one after the other. Uh, and at the end of these five proofs, uh, he, he says at the end of each one, that is quod omnes dicunt deum. Uh, that is the roughly the sort of thing that everybody means when they say God is the first cause. God is necessary being. God is, uh, uh, you know, the, the unmoved mover. And then, and this is the bit that people don't read, Aquinas pulls the rug from under our feet and says, but we don't know what it is we've proved. We haven't a clue what we mean when we talk about necessary being. All the beings we know come from another being in some way. They are contingent beings. Uh, we're talking about a being that is necessary, that is being itself. God is not one of the things that are. God, says Aquinas, is not a sort of thing. God is being itself. Esse se ipsum. And, and when we talk about God being simple, simple being itself, we, again, we don't know what this means. Because, says Aquinas, we are composite beings. We have bodies, we have spirits. Uh, there are things you can say about us, like we're female or male or fat or clever or old or a, uh, a dancer. You can't say any of those things about God. God is being itself. Again, we don't know what this is. All we've proved is the existence of a mystery. Now, uh, the word mystery gets us because we uh, get another of those words that have got devalued. Mystery is often seen to be a sort of mumbo-jumbo, some sort of difficult thing. We don't um, uh, know what on earth it can mean, uh, but we just believe it. Uh, but this is uh, quite bowdlerized. Um, 
mystery, a mysterium, in the, the, the originally in the Greek word, it was a, an activity. The ancient Athenians would take part every year in the Eleusinian mysteries at Eleusis, about 20 miles away from Athens. A sort of three-day ordeal where they fasted, they walked, where they were exhausted, they were exposed to terrible things, um, and they were exposed to beautiful things, and they got no sleep, and it was an intense experience. And at the end of this, so carefully orchestrated were these mysteries, that they, um, they found, some of them, that they were no longer afraid of dying. They had somehow come to terms with their mortality, with, with, the, with the reality of their own death. Um, and a mystery is uh, something that we do rather than uh, something that we just accept notionally on faith. Another of these words that have got mislaid. Uh, we caught, today we seem to equate faith with believing things. Uh, in so much so that we often say of uh, a religious person, is he or she a believer? As though accepting certain creedal propositions was the main thing that they do. <clears throat> no. Uh, the word belief has also changed its meaning. Uh, believen, in Middle English, meant to trust, to be loyal to, to commit yourself. Accept my belief, says the knight, Chaucer's knight, to his lord. Accept my fealty, my loyalty. Um, and the King James translators uh, used the word belief, therefore, to translate the Greek word pistis. Uh, Jesus is constantly asking for pistis, for faith. Uh, but he's not asking people to believe that he's the Son of God or the second person of the Trinity. Because pistis, again, means commitment, action, uh, dedication. Jesus is asking for pistis, that is for disciples who will give all they have to the poor who will work night and day for the coming of the kingdom, who will love their enemies, live like the birds of the air and the lilies of the field, having pistis, having trust in God their Father. And when, uh, when St. Jerome translated uh, the Greek word pistis uh, into Latin, he used the word fides, but fides hasn't got a verbal form. <coughs> faith. So he used the word credo, which comes from a, a, a root meaning cordo, I give my heart. And uh, so he, when uh, the early Christians were baptized, they would go through a colossal ceremony and uh, one of the earliest ones we have is uh, written down by St. Cyril of Jerusalem in the Holy Sep what is now the Holy Sepulchre Church in Jerusalem. And the new uh, candidates for baptism on Easter, the East Easter night would stand outside the church. They'd been fasting and preparing for the, all the six weeks of Lent. And this was a mysterium. This was an ordeal a mystery that would, that they had to do. And so they would start off outside the church looking to the west, the, towards Egypt, just as the Israelites had done, because they were going to make their own crossing through the baptismal waters as the Israelites passed through the Sea of Reeds. They came into the church, they were stripped of their clothes and plunged into the baptismal waters three times. In each, the celebrant would say, as they pulled them under, do you have pistis or uh, do you have belief, fides, in the Father? 
and they would come out spluttering and crying, Pisteo, in the sun, in the Holy Spirit. Now, these people were not sitting on the end of that baptismal pool and saying, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> having uh, surveyed all the evidence, I can now come to the conclusion that I have decided to believe in God. This was an act of commitment and a mystery, a mysterium that changed them. Uh, just as the Greeks were changed at Eleusis. Uh, made them, it, it, you would, you, it was a powerful performance and it was an act of commitment and dedication. Um, at a time when it was sometimes very dangerous to be a Christian and could cost you your life. Now, uh, belief and myth is about doing things, not about thinking things. And we have turned uh, our religion into a head trip. Um, religion, religious knowledge, is a practical skill. It's like driving or swimming. You can't... <clears throat> You can't sit <clears throat> on the edge of the pool and read a book about swimming. Um, you have to get into the water and start learn the knack of floating. And once you've learned how to float, you can't imagine how you could never do it. And you, nor can you explain how you've done it. Um, it's like driving. Again, you can't learn to drive simply by reading the highway code and studying the car manual. You've got to get into the vehicle <clears throat> and manipulate the brakes until finally you're doing it without knowing how, again, how you're doing it. Now, we have lost the knack of religion. Uh, we've become very self-conscious. We're trying to crack our heads open to believe a whole lot of mysteries um, and, it, and weird definitions of God instead of doing it. How did we get to this? Well, briefly, very briefly, in the 17th century, uh, Sir Isaac Newton, a towering genius, uh, d discovered the solar system. And he could only account for the intricacy of the solar system by saying that someone must have been there planning it. God was a... Um, was, was, uh, had become a scientific explanation. He said, from what I see, uh, we now know that the, we can prove scientifically what the Bible has always told us, that there is a being up there that is supremely intelligent and supremely wise, and we can infer that he is supremely benevolent too. And, said Newton, and here I quote, clearly well, very well versed in mechanics and geometry. Now, um, this would have made Thomas Aquinas, as I say, horrified, because, and indeed all the fathers of the church, the, the great fathers of the Athanasius, who designed the, the, the Nicene Creed that we um, uh, recite in churches like this, uh, said that the new doctrine, and it was a new doctrine, that God had created the world out of nothing, that was new in the fourth century, uh, unheard of in antiquity. No gods created the world out of nothing. They could only help along or order a creative process that was already fairly well advanced. And that includes Yahweh in the first chapter of Genesis. Um, but so Athanasius said, if we believe that God created the world out of nothing, that proves that the world can tell us nothing about God. Because its ontos, its being, is nothing, nothingness. And it can, have no, can tell us nothing about being itself, which is what we mean by God. So that the idea that you could look at the physical world and draw uh, conclusions about the nature of God was something entirely revolutionary. And good on Newton. It was that, you know, you have to try and apply your science 
to your um, other to, to, to the, the, your religion and the rest of life. But of course, it was only a few generations later before other scientists, like Laplace, for example, uh, found that they could dispense with God uh, as the first cause because he, they proved that you could that matter could start up on its own; that, that it, you didn't need an outside agent. Uh, but that wouldn't have mattered a jot. But the churches took up Newton's um, uh, idea and it became absolutely central. Newton's, Newton's theology became central to the, both to the Enlightenment and to a great deal of Christianity. And people lost the old apophatic or silent modes of thought of Dennis the Areopagite, that Bromogia sense, the idea that we know nothing about God and said we know exactly that God is a good mathematician. Uh, very much domesticating transcendence. And they lost the older habits of thought. And so when Darwin came along, they had, many people were flummoxed and had no recourse. Um, <clears throat> but let's just look, for example, quickly um, at Trinity, I, which is a mystery. Now, this would be, have been, this doctrine we now know would, would have been imparted to the new Christians after they'd been through the mysterium of their baptism. Um, it, not before, but afterwards. And they weren't told, now God is one and God is three, and they all obediently bleated this out like sheep and believed it. <coughs> It was a mysterium. It was a meditation. It was something that you do. I'll, if, you want, I, if anyone wants to ask me during question time about this Greek, the Greek idea of Trinity, I'll be happy to do so, but I'm anxious to get to the questions. Uh, but the, uh, the point of this meditation was a meditation about the nature of God where you swung your mind from God's absolute indescribable ineffability, something we could never know, to the three hypostases that we did know that gave us some intimation of what God was like. God as, God as the word, as in the man Jesus, as in creation. And back, then back to the ineffable. The three uh, revelations and the, and the one usia, which is as beyond our ken as a, as a computer is beyond the ken of a goldfish. And it was a meditation that stopped people, stopped Christians thinking about God as though God were a simple personality that you could define in the way that the Catholic Catechism did. And Gregory of Nyssa, who is one of the, uh, the great uh, uh, Greek fathers who uh, it formulated this doctrine of Trinity, spoke about this meditation. And he said, when I think of the one, my mind is drawn to the three, the Father, Son, and Spirit. And then back to the one. And he said, my eyes fill with tears, and I lose all sense of where I am. Now, in the West, we haven't done that meditation. And therefore, Trinity often doesn't make a great deal of sense to us. It's like those uh, mathematical uh, conundrums one did at school, whereby you went through a whole involved process of reasoning, and at the end, you could say that A equals B2 squared a formula which would meant, have meant nothing unless you'd been through the whole process. Similarly, because the, 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 the mysterium of Trinity was not the fact that it was un, uh, indescribable and incomprehensible, but because it was a meditation. It was something you did with your mind that would affect the way you thought about God. What we have in the Bible is a starter kit, something to work on. 
God is a personality, a very belligerent personality sometimes in the early books of the Bible. Uh, and we learn about this God very often when we're small children, at the same time as we're learning about Santa Claus. But over time, our um, understanding of Santa Claus changes and develops. But our idea of God remains often at an infantile level. And if we are just thinking um, that we'll get to God if we sort of go through, uh, make ourselves believe in it, uh, it's putting the cart before the horse for all religious people, Jews, Christians and Muslims. Um, religion is something that you do. You behave in a different way. You do things with your mind in a different way. You learn to live in compassion with other people. All day and every day, as Confucius said. And then you begin to have some understanding of what we mean by God, even though you can never define it. Thank you. Karen, thank you very much indeed. That was immensely exciting. And uh, in an age when we are deeply concerned about things like religious extremism, uh, to hear your caveats about the way in which we limit God uh, was, was very moving and very timely. So thank you. I've got a question for you, but while I'm asking it, can I remind the audience about your <coughs> moment to write down your questions and wave your question in the air and we'll come and collect them and then put them to Karen. Um, Karen, the myth of creation, mm. uh, we make an appearance in that myth when uh, we're told that we're made in the image of God. And one wonders if that's the first point at which we start to limit God by projecting an image of ourselves onto God and saying that's what God looks like. He looks like us because we're made in the image of God. Um, Dorothy L. Sayers, the early 20th century detective novelist, but also writer of popular theology, challenged uh, that interpretation of Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 by saying, up until the point at which we're told that we're made in the image of God, the only thing we know about God is that God created, and therefore to be made in the image of God means that we are most God-like when we're being creative. And I wondered if that sat within your uh, assertion that myth is a program for action. Yes, uh, very nice. Uh, because uh, creativity uh, is, a, um, is, is something that you do, that you're involved with, that you get a knack for, uh, that involves it putting yourself to one side. Too. You're not going to be a good creative uh, person if you're endlessly talking about yourself. Um, and, and it is the great spirit, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, it's when we put ourselves at the center of the picture that we have problems. And, you know, um, and also, uh, this idolatry that you mentioned, that God is just like us, this, this has been a very dangerous idea. Because it's only one step, from, you were talking about extremists. Uh, the Crusaders went into battle crying, God wills it, when they slaughtered thousands of Mus Muslims and Jews. Uh, they were projecting all their own hatred and loathing of these rival faiths onto this being and giving, the, giving it a sacred seal of divine approval. And uh, hideous things are done, and that is why all the great monotheistic thinkers were so careful to say, we cannot think about God as a personality like us, writ large, with likes and dislikes similar to our own. This is idolatry. And we can have idolatry. It's not just bowing down in front of a statue. Idolatry is also uh, a doctrine. We can make a uh, uh, of our doctrinal statements about God, we can make an idol of them. Um, and also, uh, I, we, something else we can do with the, it, God, we are in God's image. I am 
a complete mystery to myself, to be honest. I'm constantly doing things that surprise me or uh, dream, having odd thoughts or dr having weird dreams or saying, now why on earth did I do that? Um, and I'd love to be able to get, this is what Trinity is about actually, uh, God's essential usia. We try and transmit from uh, this, this weirdness that we call our self, that we find hard to define, we try to transmit it outside, in our words, in our gestures. And that's roughly what they were thinking of in Trinity. God trying to make itself accessible to us, uh, as I am trying right now to make myself accessible to you in the words that I'm choosing. Um, but we have to remember that if we are mysterious to ourselves, every single human being that we meet is in God's image and is also a mystery. Uh, is also absolutely mysterious, whoever they are. Uh, that means that um, we talk about one another in such a, an omniscient way. Oh, you know, the trouble with her is. As so though you could sum up that complicated human being in a single sentence. And we do it with whole peoples and whole nations to our great detriment. Oh, well, the trouble with Islam is. And very often, uh, when you hear someone say that what they know about Islam could be comfortably contained on the back of a small postcard. Um, <laughs> now, so we're in God's image, male and female created he them. We're all an icon of the divine. And that's an, an icon in the Greek Orthodox world. You look through it to the divine. And we should try, as one of the great uh, Muslim thinkers, Ibn Arabi said, uh, every single one of us is an incarnation of one of God's hidden names. An unrepeatable revelation of, of God to the world. And our job is to look beneath the unpromising exterior to that word, that uh, God that has been expressed in that particular person. And the, it also reminds us that we can't sum up God. Because if you think that every single one of us in the room, in this room right now, is a unique and unrepeatable revelation of God to the world, and that every single person who's been born in whatever faith he or she is, and Ibn Arabi is very clear about that, you, sh you can't sum God up or say what God is. It's another way, a form of meditating on the transcendence of the divine. A member of the audience um, is asking whether there was one particular event or experience perhaps that confirmed God and your understanding of God in your life. It's simply, I, w I went away from religion for 13 years after I left my convent. I thought wanted nothing to do with it ever again. Uh, that's it, I thought. And when I used to see people on the underground reading books about religion, I used to feel quite ill, uh, never thinking that I would be writing some of these myself one day. Uh, so you never know. I mean, one is a mystery to oneself, or you never know. Um, but... Um, for me, what changed it was my study. Not a single um, um, incident, but studying day by day. For, uh, my life was, I've written about it in The Spiral Staircase, a series of career disasters until I was nearly 50. I never intended to do this work. I wanted to be an English literature professor um, and failed, and then a whole lot of other things failed. Um, and found, I found myself writing about religion. And um, first of all, the silence, because by this time, after my latest career disaster, I was completely washed up, lost all my friends, living in a very remote part of London. And there was just me and the text. And there was no one as, le as there had been when I was working in television to egg me on to be outrageous and provocative as I was in my early works and debunking. There was just me and the text. Theology is poetry. And you cannot read a poem by Rilke, for example, at 
a nightclub. You need silence and th my relation to the texts and the subject matter started to change. And then I encountered quite early this phrase uh, by the uh, Louis Massignon, uh, the great Islamist scholar, who said that a historian of religion must approach the subject with what he called the science of compassion. Science not in the sense of Newton's science or physics, chemistry, but scientia, a form of knowledge that comes with compassion. That, uh, he said, you cannot regard the spiritualities of the past or spiritu uh, the spirituality of other cultures from the vantage point of post-enlightenment Western rationalism. You have to put that to one side and in a scholarly way reproduce all the circumstances in which that spirituality came into being and not leave it until you could imagine yourself in similar circumstances feeling the same. And I thought, well, that's what I have to do. And so when I was writing about Muhammad, peace be upon him, I had, even though I would have said I didn't believe in God at that stage, belief in who on earth was God, but uh, that was come later. Uh, but I had to put myself in the position of a man in the hell of 7th century Arabia who sincerely believed he'd been touched by God. And unless I could do that, I would miss the essence of, of the prophet. And I was do doing this, it, it's again, it's doing it, you see. Putting, I had to put clever, over-educated Karen on the back burner. Uh, forget about all I knew and immerse myself in something else. It was a way of getting beyond e ego. It was ecstasy, stepping outside oneself. And that gave, made the whole of religious experience come alive to me in a different way. But it's doing it. It's putting yourself to one side. And then, in addition to ourselves, how do we help someone, if we should help them, if we can help them, whose faith has dried up? How do we encourage them? Leave them alone. Um, I, 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 <laughs> um, you know, people have faith and have, you, you have come in all kinds of ways. You speak to people where they are, not ever where you think they ought to be, from where they are. And um, who knows wh what religion is or what faith is? Um, I mean, I've, I've moved a long, long way. I mean, there, there would be Catholics in the audience, perhaps, who think I'm, I'm lapsed, you see, that I've gone away from all that. And I'm a lost soul, and maybe I am. Uh, but um, people find holiness in all kinds of ways. Uh, in, a ch I hate to sound corny, but in a, a child's face. Or um, a book, as I did. Or an animal. Or, uh, you know... A, 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 or, or in a beautiful numinous service or in a piece of music people find a certain sanctity holiness that lifts you up and makes you think oh and ah and, uh, and so leave people alone to, to uh, don't bombard them with theology or doctrines or try to shepherd them onto the true path that is uh, they're, they're, they're on their own journey. All one can do is try and make sure that their lives are as free from pain as you can possibly make them. Yes, and and um, Dorothy Alsayers used to get very cross about the way in which the church kept ordaining good Christians. She said people can actually be good Christians without having to be ordained all the time. Yes. Just the open church bazaars, as she put it. <laughs> um, and of course, Christopher Smart's cat, Jeffrey, the spirit of the living God, uh, it, when he was in the depths of despair, he saw uh, images of, of God in, in, in his cat. Um, 
thinking of some of your opening remarks, what, one or two uh, questions that are coming in about if, if we aren't to say that God is good, um, how do we deal with expressions that are important to us nevertheless about God being love or how do we know whether God is benevolent or not? We'll never know. Uh, religion is about unknowing. Um, but I think, I think perhaps I should correct what I said. Uh, we, because theology, for all it's supposed to be geared to transcendence and unknowing, is a very wordy discipline. Uh, people like myself have written reams about God and spirituality and faith. But the idea is just to hold yourself back a little bit and say, yes, uh, hear yourself talking. Hear yourself saying, God is good, God is love, God is uh, beauty, God is justice, all those things. And then realize at the end of it that really uh, it's very hard to apply goodness as we know it, which is always fractured, always um, tainted in some way, because we're such complex beings. Um, or love. Love is, I really try not to use it very much, to be honest, because I think we've debased it so much in our culture. Uh, oh, you know, I'd love a gin and tonic. You know, I love that movie. Um, and I, it used to trouble me greatly as a child that I had to say I loved God. And frankly, I preferred the dog to God. I mean, <laughs> as someone pointed out, same letters, you know, just switch them around a bit. But, um, you know, and, and I knew in my heart that what I, when, what I meant by love bore no relation to anything I felt mm. for God. Mm. Um, and, and if you look around the world and you say God is good, and yet God is all that is. And if you believe in some analogical, mysterious way that God is creator, and you know, if you believe in providence, then you really do have a problem about the goodness of God. And uh, we've, made, we've made the word love very gooey as well, yes. so that quite often that's another way of yes. limiting God uh, in, in relation to the sort of rictus smile or inane grin that yes. uh, can, can, can be such a flimsy way of expressing and it, love. As though it's about feeling too. Um, and uh, what we've, uh, you, uh, uh, people like Dennis the Areopagite said you can't experience God emotionally any more than you can conceive him intellectually. Uh, so don't worry if your feelings are drying up. Mm -hmm. Um, it, this is all so these difficulties just to be careful about what you say about God just hold a little distance uh, so that you are, are not making God too domestic and cutting him ridiculous pronoun down to size uh, and making him something that fits into our little uh, puny mindset a lot of people are asking questions, uh, Karen, about if religion is something we do mm. rather than believe, what are your tips for doing religion well? Compassion. Um, I think I, I mentioned it with, with the whole uh, idea that, uh, of my study, learning to put myself and feel, because compassion it means feeling with the other, putting yourself in other people's shoes. And the fact that every single one of the major world faiths has developed uh, a version of the golden rule independently. Never treat others as you would not like to be treated yourself. And says that's the essence of religion. That's the test of spirituality. Uh, tells us something about the structure of our humanity. And I think if we see all traditions have uh, moments of epiphany when you see the divine in another person where you, where you behave, where you put yourself to one side and reach out to the other. And it, to behave, we now have to behave, as Confucius said, who, he was the first person who formulated the golden rule 500 years or so before Christ in a form that was actually written down. <laughs> 
and he said it was the cent central thread that pulled through all his teaching. Master, they said, which of your teachings can we put into practice all day and every day? And Confucius said, never treat others as you would not like to be treated yourself. And all day and every day, we have a habit, uh, don't we, of saying when we've done something nice for somebody, well, that's my good deed for the day. As though we could then return to the, for the next 23 hours <laughs> to our usual greed, bitterness, and selfishness. No, but all day and every day, to put yourself empathetically and with a great deal of intelligence and insight into the position of the other. Um, you then uh, begin to lose that me, me first, uh, ego full uh, characteristic uh, that is what holds us back from God or from what we call God. They all say that because we get stuck within our puny, selfish, egotistical little selves. Um, and as a young nun, uh, we did all kinds of things to get rid of ego, you know, kissing the floor and kissing people's feet and confessing our sins in public. It was all a complete worse waste of time. Because these kind of practices made one, you know, as we enumerated yet again our many sins, it's, you were stuck in the ego that you were supposed to transcend. Uh, far better to pour yourself out in compassion and respect which doesn't have anything to do with love or feeling for the other all others whoever they are um, and frankly I think if we don't do that um, today uh, and interpret the golden rule globally so that we treat all peoples as we would wish to be treated we are not going to have a viable world the sages who composed the golden rule were living Confucius, Hillel, Jesus, um, uh, the, the, the sages of the Upanishads, they were all living in societies like our own where violence and greed had reached an unprecedented crescendo. And they all realized that unless we observe this rule, human beings would destroy one another. And that is even more true today. <laughs> Karen, when we consider the Bible as allegory, uh, our mind flies perhaps to certain historical events which Christians would say are crucial to their faith. Jesus' resurrection, somebody's asking, is it real-time event or is it allegory? It's not. Allegory is only one of those steps. Uh, let's say it's mythos, which means it, not that it isn't true or that it didn't happen, but that it is timeless. It's like Exodus in the Jewish sense. Exodus, uh, which is the great myth of the Hebrew uh, people and uh, commemorated in Passover. And the Passover liturgy says that every single Jew must consider himself as one of the people who escaped from Egypt. You, it's timeless. You have to make that journey. And we have to be resurrected too. Now, if you notice it, if you read the New Testament clearly, it's not at all clear what actually happened on Easter Sunday. We've got numerous versions. There's an empty tomb and Mark finishes his gospel. The tomb is empty. And then later they add that extra bit because they found that a bit bald. Um, and you've got all kinds of different stories about what Jesus did. Um, and, you know, people recognize him in other people. Or he suddenly, he's not, he's not a body getting out of the tomb because this body comes and goes. He's suddenly with them or he disappears. Or, uh, then, uh, and St. Paul has a completely different account where he um, looks at the resurrection of Jesus, uh, the resurrection appearances of Jesus, and says, this is, and finally he appeared to me too, as though these were visions that people were having. And so w they are not telling us what happened. What they're telling us is the effect this happened and how, how this radically changed this frightened group of Christians and 
how they experienced it. Let's look, for example, at the story Luke tells of the road to Emmaus. You've got two of the disciples, and they're not mentioned. This is, this is significant, because the other, they're very keen to say who these people were. This is all of us. They're two disciples, and they're wandering around. They're extremely distressed because of the crucifixion. And a stranger joins them. And the stranger says, what's, what, what's troubling you? And I always think it's really a good thing that these uh, disciples weren't Brits. British, because they'd say, oh, nothing, thanks, we're fine, and gone on, and that would have been the end of the conversation. <laughs> but, um, but they do. They t- allow this stranger into their raw grief. And taking that risk, the stranger could have just said, you mu- th- what, that poor sap, the Messiah, you must be joking. But they made that act of faith. And he, they allow that stranger to change their faith as they, he reinterprets the scripture in a different way and so they, they see new things in it. Then they come uh, to the place where they're lodging and they invite him to have dinner with them and he breaks the bread and in that moment they recognize the Lord and he's gone. Now what this story seems to me to be saying is that in future we will find Christ, the risen Christ, in our study of scripture, in that rabbinic study of scripture where you're looking for something new, um, in the the rich liturgy, in the breaking of bread together, and in an encounter with the stranger. Because Luke's community were a mixed community of Jews and Christians living together, having to accommodate one another's differences um, and allowing the stranger into our lives. These, I think, they are... If a body walks out of a tomb, that's very interesting. Uh, But it's got to come into my life. And what myth does, what myths do is they show you how you can make the resurrection experience something in your life. And it's even done say with the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, um, who uh, we have a, a great deal more detail, historical detail about him, but his life has been, is, and, and the way he behaved has been uh, in, in, in forms, it's the basis of Muslim law. So that Muslims will pray and wash and speak and greet people as he used to. And they are making the prophet, peace be upon him, their own. They're lifting him from the 7th century and bringing him into their own lives and into the present. Mm. And and similarly, um, in relation to the resurrection appearances, action, the breaking of bread, perhaps also the the frying of fish on the seashore, Mm. facilitate recognition. Uh, Then in Jesus' teaching ministry, someone's asking what uh, exemplifies doing in in relation to Jesus in in the way that you use the word doing. Yes. What teachings? What, 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 uh, ex- what in, what is, um, in what ways does Jesus exemplify doing in his teaching ministry in the sense that you... Always going out to people on the outside. Um, you know, so often Christians are very sort of respectable and, you know, orthodox and you do this and you, the people out there are sinners and, or they're not Christians or have you found Jesus or you haven't found Jesus, sorry. Or not. Now, Jesus seemed to spend his life breaking down these barriers, having dinner with the wrong people, talking to tax collectors and sinners. Uh, people called sinners by the Jewish establishment, uh, breaking down these barriers. He had what one of the Chinese sages called Yan Ai, concern for everybody. And an anarchic figure in many ways. Um, And I think that's the thing that impresses me the most. Uncomfortable figure. I always found him extremely uncomfortable as a young girl, and, and my uh, impressions have not changed. I mean, he, he had, had a temper, and he would say sometimes, you know, that 
Woe unto thee, Chorazim. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. I don't know if you, any of you have ever been to Chorazim. It, uh, I thought, imagined it as a sort of Galilean Las Vegas or something. But I, when I went, uh, this poor little place, you know. Now, and you won, I, I, I found him very alarming in that respect. And I think he would have been an uncomfortable figure. And I often wa wonder, what would he think of this place? Um, what would he, or, or, or my, fan, my own particular fantasy was to show him around the Vatican. <laughs> um, or the Lambeth Conference. <laughs> I, um, you know, it, he, he's, he, so I think feeling that sense of discomfort with him, uh, that he's not just uh, got a lamb on one hand and a little baby on the other. This is a very vibrant human being who upset a lot of people. Um, but who went out and reached out continually to people who were on the outside. But, but could also take people away and uh, deal with them privately. I mean, it's interesting in the Zakir story that yes. he takes him away and, and, and dines with him and something extraordinary happens that we're unclear about except the, the result of it. And that's perhaps the, anti, the, the, the other side of the, the, uh, the troubling, disturbing Jesus. Maybe. Um, maybe. Who knows, because he's so... Uh, we, we've got not one Jesus, four. Mm. Each of the Gospels presents Jesus in a very different way. Um, and, um, and, and that's deliberate, because by that time, the, the New Testament is being compiled. Jesus is much too vast a, a phenomenon in Christian lives to be tied down to a single view. Um, and so... Um, that some, and St. Paul, who was not interested in Jesus' teachings or life at all. For, G, for Paul, Jesus is a mysterium. Uh, something that you do, you have to go into the tomb with Christ, you have to suffer, uh, and you have, as he said, to put yourself at the back in, the, in Philippians, be like Christ who emptied himself. Uh, and you do it, then you get what Christ is. A, a very... Um good question here. A member of the audience is asking what do you think about intercessory prayer? Can we ask God for things? Well, I really can't uh, myself, but that's because I've always been absolutely hopeless at praying. Um, I was absolutely, as a nun, this was a complete drawback. Uh, uh, because um, <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, I, I it, this is where, actually, I, I actually found the Latin much more, very helpful as a girl. Uh, because it reminded you that this isn't speech like we're having now. And I think intercessory prayer is difficult. I think all prayer is difficult. I, I'm uncomfortable with, you know, the idea of praising God as though he's sitting up there expecting all this kind of praising. Oh, endless, you know, saying we're miserable sinners and all the rest of it. You know, as though God is supposed to know all this already. God is nearer to you than your jugular bone, bone says the Quran. Uh, so what I see, I see prayer, uh, if you are, are praying in this way, as for us rather than for God. I think what it helps you to do, because it's tough out there in the world, we very rarely apologize for anything straight. Uh, you know, if we say we're sorry, we usually make it clear that the other person has also been at fault and had something to do with it too. There's <laughs> just the odd word here, there. Um, and um, we never express complete need uh, we can't afford to let our guard down on that side or to, or to let people know how uh, frightened we are or to um, or pray how often we do we ever praise people wholly and sincerely uh, my favorite remark uh, in, in that way was when somebody came up to me and said congratulations on all your wonderful reviews and two minutes later said have you put on weight recently <laughs> um, you know we, 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 we somehow feel that if we're praising somebody we are ourselves impaired in some way now in prayer you can 
express your need, express your yearnings and what you'd like to see happen. And learn to use language in a different way. And that might rub off. Do I think God is going to answer my prayers? No, because I don't think God does do that. Uh, you know, if he does answer my prayers and say, I've, got, I've been having some difficulty with my back at the moment, and if I ask God to take away my backache, I'd have real problems then, because why didn't God answer the prayers of the six million Jews who died in Hitler's camps, or the 60 million people who died under Stalin? Um, or, the, or people who are, or children who are dying, or that little girl who was killed, you know, was taken away and abducted last week. Uh, you know, it, it becomes, this is, beca we are now approaching an apophatic moment where we, we say God will answer our prayers, and yet God clearly is not doing that. And yet we continue to have trust somehow. Uh, that we uh, can, can uh, that, that, that there is some benevolence or some plan, because we are beings that feel fall very easily into despair. Well, then I, I might ask very nervously, as the person who oversees the worship of this place as presenter, what about worship? Is worship just for us? No, I think I think worship should change you. Um, and um, and I, I think, but I think it does it in all kinds of ways that isn't about words. Um, I think uh, ritual, and again, what I took away from my convent years was the liturgy. Um, we and, and the plain song, singing the Gregorian chant. I can't sing um, at all, uh, but. Um, it was very, we all had to be in the choir and I'm glad I did learn about it and, and, and how it expressed things without words and gestures. And when I was in that Russian Orthodox um, service, I felt very at home because of this, this singing uh, which just uh, brings you into uh, a sense of sacredness. So I think worship is tremendously important. But I, I very often, and in a place like this, um, you know, you're reminded of the imperial court. And the Russian liturgy was very much based on the, you know, the imperial court of Constantine in, in Byzantium. Uh, and I don't like thinking of God as some emperor sucking up all these praises and you know this is an inadequate idea of God we need to pass on and say God is not like that uh, it should make you realize that we're together where we can express our need and I think transcendence is important where music can lift you and do things for you that words can't do uh, the Christianity is a bit too wordy you remember um, in Passage to India when Mrs. Moore is having her experience of n nothingness in that cave. She is feeling absolute despair and utter desolation and she says that she can get, in this moment, get no help at all from what she calls poor little talkative Christianity. Uh, Sometimes we need a bit of silence in our worship and silence can be produced by music or just to give us Something where we can feel ourselves taken over by the community, by the fact that we're together uh, and yearning and lifting up and, and hoping for something um, and bringing the suffering of the world into the room. I think we need to do that. The, 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 the Church of England's um, contemporary worship, common worship, uh, has as its preface, um, liturgy is not liturgy unless you do it, which chimes very well with what you're saying. Uh, but this is from the liturgical commission that then produced 10 volumes of words <laughs> for us to do the worshipping with. Um, uh, Karen, you, uh, you spoke um, uh, in your lecture about, you, you gave us a, a broader interpretation of the word belief. And, and you mm. talked about the, the Middle English um, word from which uh, we get the word belief. And you talked about commitment. 
for example, uh, if a member of the audience is asking, if religion is simply a commitment to a life in service to something greater than ourselves, how different uh, is this commitment to anything else? For example, commitment to politics or commitment to a love affair. What does religion add to that commitment? Well, you see, I think this is another of the words that we don't understand, religion. Uh, this is a, a, a word and a concept that we've developed in the West in the 17th century, a little bit in early modern period, people like Locke and Hobbes and people who were creating the modern nation state. And after the wars of religion, uh, we said, let's keep religion out of politics. Now, no, and we developed this idea of religion as something that is private, personal, that has, you know, it's, 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 it, it's in sort of established places like this. It's got creeds and it's got uh, a set of practices that are distinctly religious. This, no other, uh, no other uh, culture has any concept that corresponds to that, of religion as something separate from life. Uh, religion pervaded everything. And so it would pervade politics. Every poli political uh, ideology before the modern period was imbued with religion. And what we've tried to do is, it's like, it was like the gin in, in a cocktail. And we've tried to take the gin out of the cocktail and put it back into a separate flask and say, don't get it mixed up with these other things. So I, I think, and, and the word religion used to mean, before the modern period, it used to mean a monk or a nun. Uh, or the religious life was the life of a monk or nun as opposed to a secular clergyman, perhaps like yourself, who was in the world. But the world was also holy. And so uh, we try to hive holiness off into, into a separate thing. I think, you see, Confucius, who founded the Golden Rule, he wouldn't have known what we meant by separating religion from politics. When he was asked by his disciple, Master, how can we apply this to politics? He said, uh, go among the common people as if you were in the presence of an important guest. Uh, never treat others as you would not like to be treated yourself. You seek to establish yourself, then seek to establish others. This is, these are all ways of service. And you may find yourself totally turned off by religion and hymn singing and things, but you can give a life of service. And for me, that is profoundly religious. Mm. And you can lose yourself and make a difference to the world and experience transcendence or what we call God in other people. And, and not containing worship within the church building. One of the best post-communion mm. prayers is the one that says, uh, send us out to be a living sacrifice. Yes. And uh, worship can also involve doing what we do extremely well in the world rather than making do with second best or turning religion on as we go into a church. And I'm in mar I've never been married. Uh, but marriage seems to me literally a mysterium, a mystery. Uh, I don't know how people do it. Every day you have to forgive something or to accommodate somebody else. This is a process, a spirituality. Um, and that, that whole activity is of its essence of what... This is how we are. We try for ecstasy. You know, getting outside the self in all kinds of endeavors and we fail when we put ourselves first and we fail in a marriage or we fail in politics or we fail as artists and, and Karen a final question and, and, and apologies that we haven't been able to ask everybody's questions a very very large number uh, have been coming in which I think is a, a, a response in its own way to to what Karen's offered us this evening but a final question uh, Karen that might perhaps also lead you into some closing thoughts which we'd very much appreciate um, is it possible to say anything positive and meaningful about God yes uh, as long as you realize that it's only um, limited. You, can say, you must say things that are positive about God. But just as I say, keeping on listening to that, listening to yourself, listening to... And, and then tipping over to say, ah, oh, 
God, as the Muslims say, is Allahu Akbar. God is always greater, greater than we can conceive. So you affirm and deny at the same time, and it's it's uh, uh, and and you, you and, and and so it's it's a sort of dialectical process. One uh, eggs on the other. Um, but uh, remember too that as. Uh, Jesus said, it is not those who say, Lord, Lord, who will come into the kingdom. Um, that we can have, make all these fine speeches. And we can uh, have all these wonderful liturgies and soaring hymns of praise. And they're all fine, but we, we, always, though we always remember how limited our minds are. And how little we know how little uh, we know about other people, other people ourselves, let alone God, what we mean by God. Uh, and the, the great joy is to realize the limitation of our minds and to realize that there is something, what we call the all, the Brahman, the all. Um, and, but speech isn't enough. Uh, and belief isn't enough. Those who say, Lord, Lord, it's not enough. It one must go out and take that experience, that reverence, that sanctity that we are, we're trying to express when we speak about God, the holiness, and see it in others and confer it on others. I think the great insight of Confucius was that he took the old rituals of courtesy uh, that had been in Chinese society for a long time, which was supposed to give, uh, when you were courteous uh, to your father, you bestowed on your father a sort of godlike sanctity. The act conferred a sanctity. Confucius saw the moral point of this, that when we treat other people, whoever they are, with absolute respect, they become worthy of that respect. They become, we're, we're giving them holiness. We're passing holiness on to other people. Because God is everywhere. God is the all. God is everything. That's why it's so difficult to say anything about him. Him. <laughs> and, and, how, and even as we use that pronoun, uh, it's a good reminder of the limitations of our speech. But the idea is not just to, to, to conceive God intellectually, but to bestow that holiness on others and to see it in others. And by, in seeing the holiness in others, you convey, you make people holy. You bring sanctity into the world. Uh, Karen, at one level, we've been doing what we shouldn't, which is sitting and talking about it rather than doing it. But you've talked about it so actively and in a, such an energizing way that it hasn't felt like merely sitting, talking about it. And I think also you've shown us that um, understanding our limitations actually sets us free. So thank you very, very much indeed for being with us and for sharing what you've shared with us tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, Karen Armstrong.